We're just holding one more minute. Here's Raphael. All The Ramsey County Board of Commissioners meeting is now called to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Fretham? Here. Maris Castillo? Here. McDonough? Here. McGuire? Here. Ortega? Aye. Reinhardt? Here. Carter? Here. Thank you very much. Commissioner Maris Castillo, while the rest of us meet, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, thank you. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. We have a substantial set of work to do this morning. It is the workshop day. And so following our COVID update and a number of administrative items, we will be conducting a workshop for our safety of justice team, which is chaired by Commissioner Ortega and for which the vice chair is Commissioner Fresno. Uh, a big day. And so at the start of our day, as typical during COVID times, we'll ask the county manager for a COVID update. Are you all hearing me or am I saying that you're not? Okay. Yeah. Chair Carter, we need oh, to approve the agenda first. We will need, okay, we will need a motion on the agenda before we do that, won't we? Move, move, move approval. Second. Second. Thank you very much. And we will also then um, take any comments or questions before the vote on the agenda. Thank you. Would you please call the roll? Fratham? Aye. Maris Castillo? Aye. McDonough? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Ortega? Aye. Reinhardt? Aye. Carter? Hi, thank you very much. And now the minutes of our prior meeting are before you. Is there a motion on the minutes? Madam Chair, why don't you try moving your microphone just a little bit more directionally? Thank you. I hope that helps. Move approval. Okay. Second. 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 Thank you very much. Are there any comments, questions, additions, or subtractions from the minutes? And if not, would the clerk please call the roll? Fretham? Aye. Maris Castillo? Aye. McDonough? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Ortega? Aye. Reinhardt? Aye. Carter? Aye. Thank you, our minutes are approved. And now, without further ado, I will call on the county manager for our COVID update. County Manager O'Connor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, actually fill in for uh, County Manager O'Connor at the Chambers today. Um, so thank you and good morning, Commissioners. I am joined today by Director Kathy Hadeen, and she will be providing our COVID update briefing this morning, and she will be followed ah. by County Manager O'Connor with additional remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Tolzman, and thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. 
Uh, I will provide you with the state and county situation update today. I'll show some changes to our COVID-19 uh, situation update dashboard and mention where we are with testing. So uh, here's the current COVID situation update in Minnesota and Ramsey County. We'll move over to the data dashboard. In Minnesota, 84,311 people have tested positive for COVID-19. Since I was here a month ago, that's an additional 20,000 people uh, from uh, today's date. T uh, total cases requiring hospitalization in the state is 6,931. Hospitalized as of yesterday is 233. In the ICU, as of yesterday, is 135. Both are less than what it was a month ago. 1,971 people have died from COVID. It's an additional 160 people in the last four weeks. And the total approximate number of completed tests across the state is 1,724,779, an additional 600,000 additional tests in the last month. As we move over to the Ramsey County page, uh, we've actually rearranged the data and added uh, different data points to our COVID-19 situation update. Uh, you will see here the cumulative cases up top. Uh, we've kept that there, but we've shortened the graph to just past three months. It appears uh, the number of infected have gone down for the first two weeks of September, but we'll see if that remains true as a trend uh, as last weekend numbers were uh, up again. As we scroll down further, you'll see cumulative case rates per 10,000 residents and the weekly case rate, which is currently 9.4. And there with the lines with the dots, you can see that we also compare how we compare to the other uh, counties uh, in the metro as well as the state. This is the percentage of total tests for the week that came back, uh, for the tests that have come back positive. 5% uh, is the World Health Organization's goal. To get there, we need to have sufficient testing, have education, social distancing, and we need to continue to wear masks. As we scroll down, you'll see the number of tests performed by week. I'd like to think that the larger numbers in August are due to the Ramsey County testing sites. You'll also find the percentage positive, the percent positive by Metro counties where Ramsey is currently sitting at 5.6%. You can see again how we compare to our neighboring counties. If we move on over to our testing page, remember you can go to www.ramseycounty.us slash coronavirus to find all the updated information about COVID-19. We're currently offering two testing events. Actually, one was yesterday at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church and the other on September 23rd from 2 to 6 p.m. at the Mex Mexican Consulate. Our emphasis for these two testing sites is on people who speak Spanish or identify as Hispanic, Latino, Latina, uh, based on data uh, uh, that we've been receiving from community. We need to make sure that we're emphasizing testing within these communities. Staff and volunteers who speak Spanish will be on site to help answer any questions. These two testing sites are in partnership with the Mexican Consulate, CLUES, Minnesota Community Care, St. Mary's Health Clinic, Minnesota Department of Health, and M Health Fairview. Oh. Just to recap, um, more than 5,000 people gained access to tests by getting tested at our August testing sites. Saturday, testing events will resume uh, at Aldrich Arena uh, beginning September 26th, and that information will be updated on our website within the coming weeks. Uh, you can get this information about COVID-19 again by going to www.ramseycounty.us slash coronavirus. I now will I'll keep my remarks short because I would like to turn the rest of the COVID-19 update over to County Manager O'Connor. Thank you, Director Hadeen and uh, Director Toldman for being in the chambers today. It's good to be with all of you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Today, I'm gonna to do a little bit of a different update. I'm gonna to use today's COVID update to do what I can to continue our efforts to destigmatize, demystify, and deconstruct the experience of contracting COVID and dealing with its impact. I'll be using the example of my family and I in hopes that talking about our experience helps Ramsey County continue to learn and improve as it works to serve residents and it helps our employees as well during this 
unbelievable and, count. In late August, our experience started when my son uh, in an early child care center was exposed to COVID in late, as I mentioned, in late August. There's a ton I could share about recommendations, challenges, getting good information that aligned from health authority recommendations with the medical care you could receive on the ground or the testing care you could receive. And I'm happy to elaborate that um, on any specific questions that people may have now or later about these efforts. I'm just gonna summarize all of that ordeal by saying that the mantra, particularly that's been set at the federal level of, if you need a test, you can easily get one, remains removed from the lived reality on the ground that I experienced. And in conversation since then, many of our own employees and residents have experienced over these past few months. We have work that we continue to need to do. I don't wanna go further without also highlighting that throughout my experience, my family has had access to discussions with public health leadership, quality healthcare through my employer, a flexible and supportive employer, no barriers due to language, income, or historical distrust of governmental systems that had caused harm to me or my relatives directly. Mine is a story of privilege and access, and it was yet still a challenge to navigate COVID for my family and I over these past few weeks. It is therefore important that we again pause, do all we can to put ourselves in the shoes of others, better yet, listen to their stories, and remind ourselves that as hard as we are trying, we need to keep pushing and keep trying harder to do better to ensure that all receive the care they need during this challenging time. Ultimately, I became symptomatic on or around the 1st of September. I spent eight days with the wicked virus that caused a constant headache, significant fatigue, aching deep in my lungs, chills and other symptoms. I was fortunate to avoid the significant breathing issues or the loss of taste or smell. And my heart sincerely goes out to everyone who had more seriously experienced those symptoms and their families that have had to go through that with them. About a week behind me, my wife experienced similar symptoms. And I am glad to report that we are both on the mend, but the mend can take a while. Her case is a continued part of this process. I think it is important with a, a virus that continues to come up that we continue to talk about a few things importantly. This isn't just the flu. I wish I would have had the flu. And while I am glad that some people don't get symptoms, those who do can immediately recognize the difference between this virus and a seasonal flu. While there is no doubt that age and other health conditions can play a significant role in the severity of the virus, I'd like to share that only a month ago before contracting COVID and experiencing its effects myself, I undertook a 12 mile or a 12 hour, 200 mile ride by bike across Minnesota over the course of a night and into the next morning. In other words, no one is immune from contracting this virus, regardless of your physical state, your age, or how hard you try to do the things right by wearing a mask, staying away from others, staying outside and doing the best we can. I share this story because as schools wrestle with their reopening decisions, you as leaders in Ramsey County and our peers and partners across Minnesota wrestle with challenging choices every week. I want our employees to know that we stand with them. I want residents to know that we're gonna to continue to work with and on their behalf. And I want us to be reminded that we are ultimately on this challenging moment together, no matter our position or stature, it is in our togetherness that we will be determined how successful we ultimately are. As I close, I want to thank the dedicated staff who I've had the fortune of working with as my family has navigated COVID and its impacts on all corners of our work and home life over these past few weeks and will continue to impact our life until my final son is allowed to be out of quarantine around October 1st. That's a month from the beginning to the end of how long this can impact a family based on testing and everything else. I wanna give special thanks to Sam Sam Muhammad in the Ramsey County Public Health Department and Yingling Sun in the Minnesota Department of Health for their work as contact tracers. They were helpful, they were compassionate, they highlighted all that is right about the work we as government are doing to contain this virus. When they called, it was wonderful speaking with them, learning more, they gave ideas and, and advice, and they really were that sense of pointing out why contact tracing is a key part of an important and personal government response. 
I want to thank Elizabeth Tolman for sharing her time and doing her work to serve as acting county manager to the entire executive team, senior management team, leaders at all levels of this organization and this county board for continuing forward through all the budget meetings over the last two weeks. There has been a ton of work and I've been involved to the extent possible while making sure to make time for healing and family. I will use this experience to continue to learn and grow as a leader here and with everyone around us. We are now working with health partners to continue to provide better information to our employees about how to navigate testing. There is better information that I was given in secret moments, it felt like along the way, than the official information you at first read about where to go and where to turn. And it's not actually secret, but it's making sure that we raise that information to the forefront and make it available. I will continue to work with our public health department to ensure that community testing is a key part of this solution. We need more accessible sites to ensure people can get tested when they need to be, regardless of their healthcare provider and circumstance. We need as much ability as possible to help people navigate as questions and challenges come before them. And they're trying to figure out what to do with conflicting pieces of information that be given by well-intentioned individuals who are trying to help, but sometimes can lead to confusion. And I wanna thank our public health leadership who continues to use the insight from my experience to help us as we continue our efforts to improve and grow with MDH, with health partners, and with our community. I was in constant contact throughout this process with them because it gave us a first-hand view of the experience from start to finish of the individual and household going through COVID. I wanna say thanks again to the board, Madam Chair, and all of you. I would take any questions you have if you'd like to, but generally I hope sharing my experience is just another um, piece in a much larger community and global experience we're all going through right now. Thank you. And we would have any questions for today's COVID update. Thank you very much. Once again, welcome back. Uh, seeing you on the screen, I jumped the gun and called on you. So thanks again to Director Tolzman for being in the chambers with us, um, a very, very special thanks for your personal experience, for the lessons from that personal experience, which will definitely help to guide us through. And we do know that members of our Ramsey County team have, as have our entire community, been working through COVID-19. Uh, so your reflection on what those experiences are like in our workplace and in our families and communities. It's just very much appreciated. I'm going to look at our participant list to see where our questions are coming from at this point. I have Commissioner Ryan Hart. Commissioner Ryan Hart. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to also say thank you very much to County Manager O'Connor for sharing his story because it's Something that, you know, we look at numbers every week and the totals and, and what's happening. But when you look at a, a young family um, like uh, County Manager O'Connor's and uh, going from an asymptomatic uh, child in, in the childcare setting um, to both of the parents um, experiencing COVID-19 and what it means. Um, I think that because you were willing to make that personal statement about what you went through, I think that you have helped a lot of people understand just how serious this is. So I just wanted to give a heartfelt thank you and uh, wishes for a continued recovery because I know it's not something that you get over with, get over um, in a very short period of time as well. So I just wanted to say that um, heartfelt thank you. Looks like we lost Tony. I'm sure she's probably signing back in. I don't see her on the screen. Do you, any of you? Chair Carter, uh, I, Chair Carter I, texted me. She, um, her screen was frozen, so she is um, coming yeah. back on. Okay, I did have my hand raised, so I'll jump in without being called on the chair, if that's all right. While Tony uh, signs back in. All right, thanks for sharing your story. I appreciate it. Uh, but listening to your story, I think especially if public health is 
willing and interested to looking at your experiences to help um, you know understand impacts to employees. I think it would be helpful if we identify you know a couple other employees, right? Because you know even though it's not in secret, there you know certainly you have the public health director on speed dial who has the commissioner of public health on speed dial. Um, so it'd be interesting to see the stories and impacts of a frontline worker for Ramsey County. Not necessarily compared to your story, but to really make sure that we're really understanding, maybe in a deeper, uh, more connected way, as our employees navigate this when COVID comes into their families. Um, thank you for that comment, Madam Chair, Commissioner McDonough. Just a couple of notes on it, and something we'll continue to do. Today's column is going to be on this topic and a continued piece of the conversation with our organization and and making sure that people feel comfortable being able to talk about it. Obviously, a virus, it's public, it's private information, and they have every right to privacy if they choose to use it, but they also shouldn't feel ashamed to share their story of COVID. And there's this thing of the sense of who contracts it and what were you doing to contract it and things, and we need to demystify that. I, most of our employees are doing things like taking care of children and loved ones, elder parents, going home, spending time with their family. It happens, it's viral. Um, we did spend some time yesterday in a regular meeting with our labor unions that we have, a check-in moment, and this was a part of the conversation. And that direct ask around the testing, got, um, information from health partners and clarity was a big question that they've been getting a lot as well, and they've heard. And so that was something that I, I personally understand that and want to make sure we're working on that to continue to improve. Um, the other piece that comes up that is very hard as an employer and something I want to acknowledge and say we're trying to work through so my wife has never received a positive test after two tests for COVID. Uh, I only received one positive test after first receiving a negative test. The testing is important, but alone is not enough of a tool. And we're all very symptomatic. And so um, what we as an employer do when an employee does not have a positive test, but is symptomatic is extremely important, both for the health of the rest of our organization, as well as ensuring that employee has the opportunity to support themselves during that time. And that's an important piece we need to keep working on. And I know that's a concern for employees across this organization and an understandable one at that. Thank you very much. My apologies that um, I was not with you for that last question. I believe we have Commissioner Mary Jo McGuire. Now that I'm back. Good to see you. Good to see you back, Madam Chair, and uh, really good to see you back, County Manager O'Connor. We uh, are so grateful that you are in the recovery stage, and uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing your story. I echo my colleagues' gratitude for you to talk about that story and uh, help others understand, you know, the severity of this of this issue and um, and the things that one goes through and how long it does take for a family to, to deal with it. And unfortunately, we still don't know all the long lasting repercussions of this. So I, I, uh, I, I have three medical professionals in my family, so they're always talking about that. And I have a family member who also had to deal uh, in his family dealt with the same similar things that you have um, County manager and just the, the lack of testing. They didn't. They don't live in Ramsey County, so I was referring them to our testing sites on on weekends. I said, well, you should go to those. And go well, we don't live in Ramsey County, so we don't have testing sites. And our our uh, we know we have it, but I mean because our daughter has it, and they won't test us. And and I am like, well, I I was just uh, astounded at what they had to go through, which is similar to the story you just related. And so I'm glad we're going to learn from that. And uh, the, the good news for our family is that my brother has not been in touch with any of us. We've been on Zoom calls for the last four months, but he knew that his family, as his daughter was playing lacrosse, and that's where they got it, um, that they were out and about and they were not coming to our family, you know, my, my mother and I, and so we have not been exposed to that, but it's just tough to see a family member and you and everyone else go through this. So just, uh, grateful for your story and for how we uh, all need to you know be working at how how we can make it better and easier to understand for for the public so just so ha happy that you and your family are getting through it though um, I do have a couple of questions madam chair that would go to either county manager O'Connor or director Hadeen 
um, on just some of the uh, COVID uh, re responses we're having. I, is, is that appropriate for me to ask those now? Absolutely, thank you. Thank, thank you. I was in a, a couple of um, Zoom meetings in, in the past few days and I got some questions from members of, the, of, the, of our county, actually of the public, who have been asking about um, of how we might be enforcing our uh, our mask rules and our social distancing, and and they were were just wondering um, if we're uh, as in our role as um, you know reg as uh, licensing restaurants and and facilities like that if we if we have been able to take part in helping you know enforce the rules in in restaurants and how that's going and and also in parks and rec. And I've asked this question before, but I was just wondering if there was any other comments on, on how it's going within the county uh, and, and the, the level to which we've been able to enforce this. I, I expressed to them that it was a, uh, an issue of, you know, of actual you know, logistics of how we would have enough people to enforce all of these. And we really rely on the public to help with enforcement. Um, but uh, those were uh, just a couple of the questions that came up, and I said I would I would uh, bring it up again to see how we're how we're doing on enforcing our, our rules within the county, and then within the things that we license. Madam Chair, and Commissioner McGuire, I appreciate the question, um, and you're right on you know, our our ability within the public health department to enforce does land on our environmental health uh, division. So we have inspectors who go out into the community. Not only have They've been doing the regular role of, in, of inspecting uh, restaurants um, and facilities, but they're they're also there to help educate around COVID-19 and the governor's orders. And there is a process in place that they do follow um, with if there are violations to any of these executive orders within those restaurants. But really, what they work to do, and they have such great relationships with restaurants and restaurant owners um, and other uh, food establishments within our county that um, it becomes more of a conversation and a connection and how can we help and how can we connect you to um, you know our business partners here within the county system to ensure that they have what they need uh, to to be able to comply with social distancing and with keeping people safe within their establishments I'm happy to say that we have not had uh, many um, outbreaks that have come to my knowledge within our restaurants in our in our establishments um, which tells me that our uh, restaurants and uh, other facilities are taking this seriously and are doing really good work. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I, I'm glad we can highlight all the, all the great work that's being done and the, you know, the fact that these organizations and our counties are, are willing to work on this and that they're working with us as partners in it. So that's good to, good to know. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Commissioner McGuire. Um, I really do appreciate also all of the great work that is going on on our behalf. It's good to know that our positivity rate is coming within a range um, that is acceptable and that will help us to know that we are working forward in our challenge of combating COVID-19. Um, also, just very, very much appreciation if it has not already been stated because I was out with technical difficulties for a moment, but for all of the testing work that is being done and the focus as we understand is needed in the Latinx community with language assistance and with great um, partnership ability in the community that is helping us also. Once again, uh, very, very big thanks to our county manager, O'Connor. Welcome back and appreciation for all that you have shared today to help us through the challenge. I see Commissioner McGuire's hand. Yeah, thank you. Again. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I, I should have asked this as a follow-up on my last com conversation. Um, just, um, just to remind people that if they do violations and they don't feel that, you know, obviously that they're able to, uh, deal with it uh, they there is a, do we have a hotline at the county that they should call to um, report any you know violations of of the mask wearing or the um, social distancing in, in restaurants or in any of our parks what would they what should people do if when they see that 
Madam Chair and Commissioner McGuire, I will get you a number for that. But right now, um, I can update it the next week, but uh, uh, 651 2400 is our public health line. And those calls could specifically then be routed to our environmental health department. Thank you, thank you for that. I, I appreciate Madam that. Chair, Madam Chair, Commissioner McGuire, Madam if I, could, I, I think there are two different pieces to yeah. this too. I mean, the 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 regulatory side, Director Hadeen spoke to with environmental health. Um, parks would be more like any other building and people potentially coming into a Ramsey County space. I, I would start by saying, I think we have a personal responsibility to all take care of our fellow uh, you know, humans around us. And um, uh, we will never work our way through this virus if what we need is to call each other in as the solution to it. And so there's a part where I would start the appeal saying we need people to do the right thing. And I, I want to be positive and say generally the account has not been conflict in our buildings. I, I do think because the narrative that we often see on a television set tries to find a spot where there is some sort of conflict and it relates to a mask, that becomes a narrative that is assumed to be existing everywhere. And I want to commend people that have been visiting our facilities for their compliance and for their work. And my biggest advice to someone who feels uncomfortable about spacing, um, first of all, if they're, you know, let, let a Ramsey County employee know if possible, for sure. You can all call 651-266-8500. But the other part is, to the extent, extent possible, um, space yourself from that person in the short term, because in the moment of trying to prove a point that they're not spacing out, you're still too close to them, potentially, and stuff. And the biggest thing is, create space. Hopefully together we can find our way through. I, I really appreciate that response and I, I will definitely take that back. And it was it was just, um, it was an awareness for me that I was in a very small group of people and there were three questions about this that came up. And so they, once someone asked the question, the others um, had questions as well. And so I'm glad we've been able to talk about it a little bit here. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. Looking back at the participant list, there are no further questions. Again, we really appreciate the update. Uh, during COVID-19, we have been consistent with a moment of silence to recognize the challenges and to appreciate all that is being done as we work together as community through this crisis. Uh, that is ongoing and also multiplied by other occurrences. So let's take that moment of silence right now Thank you very much. All right, um, great appreciation. We're going to move on to our administrative agenda. And I would like to call first, before we do so, Commissioner Maris Castillo has the administrative agenda on Commissioner Maris Castillo for an announcement and an appreciation of someone in our county. So we can take a moment to just appreciate that person, sure. uh, Commissioner Gladys Castillo. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. We just want to say a special happy birthday to Karen Francois, who's her birthday today, <laughs> Deputy County Manager, and I know she's watching, and so happy birthday to Karen. <laughs> um, and then I'll move the administrative items, Madam Chair. So we first moving item number six, sole source agreement with More Doors LLC for transitional housing and support services. Item number seven, the amendment one to master agreement with ROIG. Item eight, property tax abatement. Item number nine, drainage easement agreement with the Minnesota Department of Transportation and Keller Regional Park. Item number 10, Rice Creek North Regional Trail Master Plan Amendment. Item 11, master funding agreement for the Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit Project. Item 12, salary schedule and grade allocation for new classification of director of the Office of Housing Stability, unclassified. Item 13, renewal of employee retiree dental and employee life and disability insurance plans for 2021. 
Item 14, renewal of active employee and early retiree medical insurance contract with health, health partners for 2021. Item 15, renewal of regular retiree medical insurance plan for 2021. Item 16, June 2020 report of contracts, grant and revenue agreements, emergency purchases, sole source, single source purchases, and final payment. Item, and then item number 17, the 2021 budget, certify the maximum levy for proposed property tax notices. That's not on the administrative agenda. I'll second the administrative agenda. Great. Thank you. So item not, not item number 17. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the administrative items, there has been a motion for the administrative items. Is there a second commissioner? Reinhardt has seconded. Thank you. I will ask for any comments, questions, additions on the administrative items that we have just moved forward, that we have just had a motion and second for. All right. Then without comment. Chair Carter. Yes. Commissioner Preston. This doesn't need to be a big discussion, but I just wanted to say that I'm very excited that we're approving the master plan and a shout out to Rich Drummond, one of my constituents who has been asking me at least once a week when this was going to move forward. So the answer is today. It's moving forward today. I'm so excited. And I know you are too. Oh, there we go. Now we can vote. Thank you very much. And so without additional question or comments, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Maris Castillo. Yes. McDonough. Aye. McGuire. Aye. Ortega. Aye. Reinhardt. Aye. Fossum. Aye. Carter. Aye. And thank you very much. The administrative items have passed. And although I'm having a little difficulty pulling up my screen, I know there is a policy item on the agenda for certifying the maximum levy. I will ask the county manager if there's presentation, but we should get a motion on that. Commissioner or Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Reinhardt, Chair of the Budget Committee. And if there is not a presentation, I would like, well, I will move this, whether there's a presentation or not. And then I would like to speak to it, depending on whether or not there is a presentation. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And thank you for the second. So there is a motion and a second. And I'm going to ask if there is a presentation on this. I'm having a little technical difficulty seeing things right here. I'll go to Director Tosman. Madam Chair and Commissioners, there is no formal presentation on this other than the item itself. But the CFO is here in the chambers, and we just wanted to thank the board for the past two weeks and all the service teams and departments who presented their budget presentations before the board. And if you need us to remind you of any upcoming dates, we're more than happy to. But there's no formal presentation at this time. Thank you very much, Director Tosman. I really appreciate the work that has been done on this. Commissioner Reinhardt, Commissioner Mattis-Gaskill working in the Budget Committee to help guide us forward and all of the work that we have heard of from the county manager, from the deputies, and from our departments. It's greatly appreciated as we prepare. Are there any questions from commissioners? You may have to jump in because I'm having a little screen difficulty at this time. Madam Chair? Yes. Again, Chair of the Budget Committee, I want to also give my acknowledgement and thanks to the staff. It was a very important process that we went through. And I do want to, and I'm very pleased that we were able to bring forward a budget or a levy. This is certifying the maximum levy. And although the initial budget, we do a biennial budget, the initial budget had an increase in the levy of 4.5%. And I usually have the numbers in front of me, but for whatever reason, I couldn't find them right now regarding the 
um, actually, I think I do have them here because I think it's significant. I mean, what, what ended up happening with this budget is um, nothing short of phenomenal as far as our staff and everyone pulling together. And I also want to thank uh, Commissioner Maris Castillo. Um, she is the vice chair of the budget committee. And as we worked through this process um, before COVID even started, we were really hands-on trying to um, work with folks to make sure that we got the best that we could for our community. So um, the original budget for 2020-2021 was approved on December 19th, uh, 17th, excuse me, um, on, uh, let me see here. This is kind of crazy here that I can't see everything. Um, anyhow, th that uh, county manager had put forward was, as I said, f uh, four and a half percent levy increase, and it was, I think, about $21 million in increased spending, but that I don't have in front of me. Um, I do know that we got it down to uh, about $5 million in spending increase over 2020, but uh, the 0.0% levy increase that we are certifying today is the result of a lot of hard work um, because we also have to consider not only um, did we did the departments have to deal with uh, bringing the levy down, but at the same time we had increased needs, increased costs that could not have been anticipated. And so with the uh, killing of George Floyd with COVID-19, um, all of the work that's happened regarding sheltering and um, trying to make sure that everyone is safe in, in congregate settings and moving people out of congregate settings. Um, the amount of work that has been done by our staff, again, is just phenomenal. And I didn't want this moment to go by without really expressing our gratitude. And I know every member of this board feels the same way. But I do want to give the, the dates that are coming up. We had our one public hearing. Um, we have another public hearing on uh, November 30th at 6.30 p.m. And um, we're going to be holding that both virtually and in person so that we can do, make the best use of technology that we have while keep, keeping people safe. And of course, today we are setting the maximum property tax levy. On December 1st, the Budget Committee will discuss changes to the 2021 budget requested by board members. And as you all know, I do have an addendum that is coming forward. On December 15th, the County Board will give final approval to the 2021 budget, including any changes that were approved, and then set the final 2021 property tax levy. Um, again, County Manager O'Connor, Acting County Manager doing the budget hearings, um, Elizabeth Tolzman, CFO, Alex Kutza, um, and all the staff involved. Um, this is uh, a, a great outcome to not only uh, bringing the levy down to 0.0%, but never losing sight of what we are trying to do as a county regarding equity and justice and health outcomes um, and moving people forward, making sure people are um, have the housing stability uh, director, the office that was just approved today. All of these things are still moving forward. We have not um, taken our, our foot off the pedal there to say that these things aren't important. They are very important. And we are still going forward with that. So I am really pleased um, to be able to uh, make this motion. And um, again, thanks to everyone involved. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you very, very much for your comments and um, just the additional information regarding the work that has gone into the budget and into this, this decision that we will be making to set the maximum levy. And also to point out that we are ever more mission focused, uh, working diligently in a planned and committed way to continue the transformation and services and investments across Ramsey County and partnering effectively in our community to do so. And so with that, I see no additional hands. I do see my participant list now, and I do not see hands of questions or comments. And so I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. 
Maris Castillo? Aye. McDonough? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Aye. Or Ortega? Aye. Fretham? Aye. Reinhardt? Aye. Carter? Aye. And so that maximum levy has passed and we have completed the administrative and policy work of our board agenda. We will now move to convening a workshop on safety and justice. Um, it is a little before 10 o'clock, well it's 9.47, and I would assume that we will take a bit of a break, but I will check in with Commissioner Ortega, who has the agenda for the Safety and Justice Service Team Committee of the Whole as chair of that committee and his vice chair, Commissioner Fretham. Uh, checking in with you, Commissioner Ortega, would you like to take a break? Sure, you can take a break. All right, and then we will reconvene in about eight minutes. It is 9.47. And so we will reconvene at, uh, let's make it 9.55. Thank you. So we are on break, recess. Let me, uh, what it sounded like now he's you heard his screen was black and so I had see a call I asked to see if they can't work with him so I, he didn't say that it's still bad but I did Could you hear me, Tony? 
I can hear you, and so we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Hmm, my video is not up. Oh, okay. Yes, I am. Yeah, my my phone keeps going. Something phone's problematic too. We're back in session, and I'll turn the meeting over to Commissioner Ortega. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to call to order the uh, Safety and Justice uh, Committee of the Hall. Uh, we're all having some little technical difficulty here, so we're a little blind, so we're going to have to help each other out here. Uh, the goals for today is to get some uh, to get uh, information back from the work that the team has been doing and uh, provide feedback in terms of direction. And the second goal would be to look at what are the type of legislative actions that we need to, to um, agree on to move forward in, for the next session in order to make this, uh, uh, to address the issues of the uh, cash bail system and pretrial justice transformation. Uh, is Scott Williams, I don't have my agenda in front of me, but from memory, uh, is yep, Scott right Williams there. on the, you wanna Scott take Williams it from Williams is in the here? chambers and he's right. there to give you an opening and jump into the work. Okay. I'm here, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Scott Williams, uh, Deputy County Manager for the Safety and Justice Service Team. We're happy to be here today to have this opportunity to, to update, uh, update you on uh, some of the activity that's been happening uh, with our service team. Um, you know, I met last winter, I met with my team and uh, going over all of, the, uh, all of the activity that's going on in terms of uh, reform and uh, discussions around alternative uh, uh, justice uh, uh, initiatives at all the different tables and the committees. And in fact, it was getting to a point where it was hard for us to keep track of all of it, which was a really nice problem to have. Well, that was pre-COVID. Then of course the pandemic hit and then a much, if not most of that work, either, at least uh, either stopped or, uh, or slowed down. With one important exception, um, we never really lost momentum in the area of bail reform and pretrial justice reform. Um, and that is something that, uh, in fact, if anything, I think it's been, uh, it's been gaining steam. So we're really excited today to have with us uh, members, of the, uh, members of the service team and also including members of the Bail Reform Committee uh, that has been working so hard and uh, we have the opportunity here to give you some updates on that today. Uh, we've got uh, uh, County Attorney Choi, who's been leading the, the committee. We also have staff from the Sheriff's Office here today. Uh, the Sheriff's Office has a, a huge role in this. And we're excited to have members uh, from the community here, uh, representation from the community also, because the community has been very active uh, and at the table with, for these discussions. And uh, so I'm gonna have uh, uh, County Attorney Choi uh, kick us off. Thank you, uh, Scott Williams and uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board. It's, uh, very, uh, it's my pleasure to be here, to be here with um, some of the stakeholders as uh, uh, the work has transpired with respect to our bail reform uh, committee in Ramsey County. The bail reform committee, um, or I should call it the work group, actually. It's not a, a, a sanction necessarily a committee, but it's a work group of uh, people that uh, are a subset of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. And I think what's m most important for you to hear is about, and I think this really articulates um, the, the values uh, that the county board has set forth in terms of how we do uh, the reform work, how we do the transformation work. I think in Ramsey County, we have come a very long ways to recognize that when we do these things that it's really critical that we engage community uh, really early on and bring them into the process and be a part of um, the design work that we um, uh, are informed by all of the various perspectives as opposed to just having system uh, leaders uh, come up with uh, and design uh, things that we can do better. And I think the process has been really, uh, for me personally, it's been really, um, um, 
uplifting and wonderful because I've gotten to know so many uh, people who care so much about what we can do better as it relates to the work that we do at the front uh, door of the criminal justice system. Obviously, much of all of this starts uh, with respect to policing, but, at this, but as people might get arrested or brought to jail, um, that's a very, very critical point for us as a community, as systems, to make sure that we're making uh, the best decisions. And so I think uh, we're, this is not a presentation today about the cash bail system, but a big part of what we're trying to accomplish as a part of the bail reform work group is to end uh, the cash bail system and figure out a way that we can transition to something that would be better, that would do less harm uh, to our communities and still deliver uh, those outcomes that we all want throughout the, the community, which would be that we want people, if um, they need to get to court, that they, and they're obligated to go to court, that, they're, that they show up, and we want to ensure that we have uh, public safety, and that's a big part of our values. So as we thought about the cash bail system, we recognize that a lot of this is out of our control in the context of if we wanted to replace the cash bail system, uh, there's a bunch of court rules and state statutes that currently exist that would need to be modified to create some, something different um, with respect to the current paradigm. And by the way, this paradigm is something that we all inherited. It wasn't something that we just uh, devised one day. Uh, from the very beginnings of this country, we have had this notion that somehow cash bail is the best way to ensure someone's a subsequent appearance in court and that and then over time we've developed this notion that somehow that might have some connections to public safety. Since we don't have the ability to influence exactly, and we'll have a later discussion about maybe the things that Ramsey County can do um, as it relates to the state legislation, but since we can't control that, we started thinking about as a community, like what can we do? to ameliorate and address some of those issues uh, that negatively impact our community because of the cash bail system, right? And so we came up with the idea that, because under the current paradigm, um, the police will arrest, they will bring them to the jail, and the truth is, is that we don't really have um, really distinct policies about who gets into the jail. And in fact, they're in the jail, and then they await a decision by the prosecutor whether or not someone should be charged with the crime, and that's usually sometime within 48 hours. But well, and then and then the judge makes a bail determination. Both sides, the defense, the prosecution, will argue about what the appropriate bail is. But we came up with the idea and said, you know what? Why do we wait in, to have a judge decide? Couldn't we as a community, couldn't we as a sheriff's office, couldn't we as the prosecutor, couldn't we as our community come up with a, a, a way in which we would actually make the decision right at the time of booking? And so that is the work that's been transpiring over the past uh, 16 months. Um, we first had our meeting that long ago. And we've been meeting, for the most part, uh, twice a month. And we've had some really great discussions. It's really great to see how we've had subcommittees of our work group uh, form. We're working on trying to find alternatives uh, to get people to get to help people get to court. We're working on other types of really important um, things that we need to discuss about defining what violence is, what are violent crimes. And uh, so all of that work has just been, um, I think, just extraordinary in the context of how we have been working collaboratively. And we'll talk a little bit more later about like who is on this committee, but for the past 16 months, we've been uh, just working together, building trust, building relationship, and having these really critical discussions. This is actually the first time that um, uh, we've actually had this discussion in a public forum, and so that's one of the reasons why we're all very excited to be able to present to you, uh, the commissioners, uh, and to our public. Uh, and then also, too, I want to underscore uh, the importance of the sheriff's uh, leadership in this particular area as we think about doing this reform. Uh, what we're doing is we're recognizing and utilizing the authority that the sheriff has to release individuals at his or her jail. And so in this context, uh, I can't say enough about the leadership of uh, Sheriff Fletcher and his staff uh, to really embrace uh, this um, possibility, but also to embrace the notion that we need to do this 
and design all of this uh, with and along with their community. And so today, uh, Eli Jarris is here uh, with me as well. And maybe, Eli, do you want to talk a little bit about just kind of the work that you've been doing as a part of this work group and uh, just all that, the community collaboration? Yeah, sure. Um, and thank you, commissioners. Uh, thank you all for allowing us to be here to uh, make this presentation uh, to you all. Uh, it has been um, very uh, meaningful and deep and committed partnership that we've had over the past 16 months. Community, uh, we've been present uh, from the onset, um, you know, collaborating and having discourse and making sure that community voice has been centralized in much of the decision making. Uh, I've been at the table representing the ACLU, but there's also been just regular community people who aren't associated with any organizations. Uh, there's been the Minnesota Freedom Fund. Uh, there's been uh, the, the, the NAACP and multiple other groups that have all collaborated uh, to help to make sure that uh, the processes that we're coming up with uh, are community informed as well as systems uh, informed. And so uh, this has been probably some of the deepest um, partnership that um, I've had organizationally uh, in much of the work that I've been doing uh, in the years that I've been working for the ACLU. And so, you know, you, we, we've hosted multiple breakout groups uh, in which, you know, people from the sheriff's department, the city attorney's office, the county attorney's office, uh, we would come and we would really try to dive in deeper um, in, inside of policies and practices uh, from a community's perspective as well as from a system's perspective. And it's been some, some, some really involved work. Um, we are finally close uh, to being uh, able to implement uh, much of what we've been ideating. I think it has been critical that uh, community has been brought in in the ideating phase as opposed to somewhere mid or downstream once decisions uh, had already been made. I, I believe that our systems partners appreciate the fact that we've been able to be at the table to help to lend our voices and to help to point out blind spots that uh, once you are systemically involved might be a little bit more difficult. Uh, we are outsiders looking in, but we're also the ones who are directly impacted by the decisions that are made. And so I do also tip my hat uh, to the sheriff's department who's been at the table consistently, uh, to the city attorney's uh, office who's been at the table uh, consistently as well, certainly the county attorney uh, for impanelments group, uh, strong partnership with the Minnesota Freedom Fund. Uh, they've also been consistently uh, at the table and great partners uh, in which, you know, we would have our own breakout meetings um, and we would meet before the meetings and make sure that we were all on the same page as well so that we're coordinated and organized and so that the meetings are as productive as possible because it's like 20 people sometimes in these meetings. And so, you know, it, it has been really deep and involved and committed partnership. And we do intend on uh, having that continue to be the same way moving forward. So as a part of some of the early work that we did as a part of the work group, uh, we had to agree on some very distinct goals uh, that we would be working towards. And so um, it took us a while, but we came up with this statement, which is to eliminate uh, harm to communities caused by the cash bail system while improving public safety and court appearances by reducing reliance on cash bail, emphasizing public safety first, ensuring no one is held because of inability to pay, reducing jail population, increasing court appearance rates, and engaging community members. These are the goals that we uh, have established uh, as part of a collaborative conversation. And we uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, as we enact these reforms, we want to be held accountable um, to uh, these particular goals. Um, and of course, as I had mentioned before, the role of the Sheriff's Office is critical in all of this. I think in many ways throughout this country, uh, the role of the jailer uh, in a community uh, has been very passive in the context that, you know, law enforcement, police will do the arrests, they bring them down to the jail, they, people get booked, and then they await, uh, if they're uh, in custody, they, they await a charging decision, and by law it has to occur within a period of time. But for the most part, that role has been very passive, meaning that uh, we, we, uh, the, the, the jailers across this country will view themselves as a part of 
uh, the system that kind of just processes all of this. And I think that as a community, what we're doing is we're recognizing that actually at the moment of booking, we actually have uh, power and discretion. And we've been talking a lot about, I think, in the context of reform, uh, that we have to think about how better to use that executive branch function of discretion about how we think about enforcing these laws. And so the sheriff's office has been critical in um, raising their hand and saying that they want to be a part of this conversation and think about how to make that decision better so that it's consistent with the community's values and also leading to the goals that we articulated in the previous slide. And um, so again, I just want to again thank the sheriff for his uh, leadership and his support of um, ending cash bail as well. Um, so, and then also we talked about this, but the role of the community in bail reform is also to co-design with system leadership. I also want to thank the sheriff's staff for uh, really embracing uh, that notion and also the staff in my office and in the city attorney's office that we're doing this together. It's not that we don't have more information or we're, we're bigger experts in this field. Actually, what we're learning is that um, the, the communities and the leaders and the people that are coming to the table, they've got a lot to tell us that we need to learn from. And so I think that's been a really uh, important process. And then a part of the, the role that the community has is, um, and we're really, um, this is an important point, is that community is there also to hold us accountable, to make sure that we're being um, uh, true to uh, the values that we set forth, that we're looking at data on a regular basis and we're looking uh, to create that infrastructure. And I wanna also at this point, just really thank the county manager. I can't think of a project that I've been involved with, uh, whether it's at the county or the city, where I felt so much support from the county manager uh, in terms of their ability to want to support this. Um, uh, Scott Williams has been really awesome to, uh, to have a, as a part of this, Rich Stevens, uh, Zach Hilton, um, but really just extraordinary in terms of the support that we've been given uh, from the county manager's office and policy and planning. So we just really, really appreciate that. And of course, a big part of what we're gonna be doing is about transparency and so, we want to be able to put into this framework and this infrastructure of how we can look at data as we kind of move forward in this particular reform. Um, the participants, um, the next slide kind of shows you all of the people that have been involved. Uh, and I also want to call out um, our judges who I think um, have been just extraordinary in terms of they've come to the table and court administration has um, basically indicated to us that uh, they, they'll do uh, what they need to do to ensure that we have um, appointments uh, where judges will be available. We're not necessarily calling them court dates because of just some of the nuance in the law, um, but uh, they've been really great, as well as the, uh, the Public Defender's Office. Um, they've been uh, one of the first partners in all of this work, and um, having that office very engaged in uh, this reform has been really critical. And then, of course, um, uh, we, we talked about the city prosecutor's office. And also, too, I want to make it very clear uh, that uh, we also have law enforcement uh, beyond the sheriff's office engaged as well. Uh, Assistant Chief Julie Bainman from the St. Paul Police Department has been a regular attend uh, participant in the bail reform workgroup meetings. And she's also there to um, uh, provide information to all of the chiefs throughout Ramsey County. They haven't had any meetings over the course of the summer. I don't think that she's been able to kind of update them and get some of their feedback, but we're really looking forward to uh, uh, their engagement because I think it's really critical as we get closer to implementation. So um, before we go in to talk a little bit about the uh, technical assistance that we have been provided, I wanna make sure that people currently understand kind of how things work, and I talked a little bit about that, but as I said before, um, you know, law enforcement will, uh, as a part of their work, will arrest people based upon probable cause, but they can't deem that to be a crime unless the prosecutor says it is a crime. So what we have constructed under the current system, so to speak, is that then they're brought down to the jail. And as I talked about, and I think throughout this country, uh, we can do so much better with respect to that decision point right at the, 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 the jail's front door. 
but they'll, they're booked into the adult detention center uh, here in Ramsey County, and then they're just held until the prosecutor can make a decision about whether charges are appropriate. And it, that depends on the level of charge, but you have a certain amount of time uh, to make that charge. But if you think about that, I mean, every morning, like, my staff, they come to work, and they're all stressed out. They're just scrambling uh, to make decisions about all of these cases that are uh, people, and they're people that are in jail, and we, hur we hurry to make that decision before that deadline is. And, but the thing is, is the truth is we don't have all of the information. All of the information that we have is basically based upon what the police might have provided to us, but there's more to consider, I think. We never have time to look at the videos, uh, et cetera. So, uh, it, so I think that just uh, making this change will, will make us have better quality decisions uh, with respect to the prosecution function. But so they're, they're held for jail and ultimately the court will make a determination of what the terms of release should be. And as a part of the system that we have is that we have a cash bail system. And so uh, they can be held for court, they can be released with conditions or released without conditions. But our point here, and this is really, really critical, is that our point is that if we can actually figure out a way to get people, uh, to give them an appointment slip instead of holding them, and if they show up to their first appearance, there's no need for bail. No judge in Ramsey County would ever impose the cash bail system on somebody if somebody volunteered to come to their first court appearance. And that's the notion of what we're trying to construct as it relates to um, uh, uh, moving away from the cash bail system. And so in the new process, in the next slide, um, this is kind of the vision of what we're looking at, but in, uh, what we would do is we would do an assessment uh, and, of course, we don't want just human beings just making decisions without being guided by policies and utilizing some form of a risk assessment. And we'll get, we'll get into the details about, about the risk assessment, but in Ramsey County, the judges have been using risk assessment for the past over 20-some years. We were one of the first jurisdictions in the state of Minnesota to use risk assessment. We do that as part of JDAI. Um, so it's an important piece of this, but it matters about the transparency and how, what kind of tool that we're going to use, right? Because we don't want to exacerbate racial disparities, right? We want to make sure that that tool has trust with our community and we want, of course, and the most important thing is that it actually works, uh, that it can help inform decision making and it's something that we can rely upon. It's not like a computer program where you put in the data and all of a sudden there's your answer. The human being has to still make that decision consistent with policy, but the risk assessment will provide a, another layer of information that can help support that uh, particular decision. So as a part of developing that risk assessment instrument, um, I'm really glad that we have technical assistance uh, through the Arnold Foundation. Uh, which is an organization that has been in the space and it's um, uh, 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 an organization that's well respected by many people who are working to create um, a progressive justice reform. But a big part of, as we think about how to build that risk assessment, because this is something that's novel. This is, I mean, typically when we do risk assessment for the purposes of <coughs> pretrial detention, we do it for judges. Typically, this notion of actually making uh, and, and doubling down on this decision of what happens at the jail uh, is relatively a novel thing. There's a few jurisdictions across the country that have made, made, kind of embarked on this, but, and so this is a really exciting for the Arnold Foundation. It's exciting for us because I think this is a new way to think about how to do that reform instead of just thinking about reform happens in a courtroom. Uh, we're recognizing that it can happen uh, uh, at law enforcement and at the point of detention. So this news, these new slides are kind of how this whole process would work. And uh, so if someone could be released, uh, we would give them an appointment slip, um, and then at a later time uh, when they came, the prosecutor would then have more time to actually review the case. But another important piece of this, and Eli has been uh, part of the subcommittee uh, to work on how do we think about like resourcing community 
to help individuals uh, kind of get to court and also position them in a way so that they might be most uh, able uh, to be uh, offered some form of uh, diversion or something along those lines. I don't know if, Eli, you want to talk a little bit about that vision at all? Yeah. yeah. I could talk briefly about that, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> so with that appointment, uh, part of, you know, what we want to also do is, one, not exacerbate problems, whereas, you know, in a lot of these cases, you know, they would be dismissed anyway. And so, you know, we certainly wouldn't want to funnel people through uh, systems in which they wouldn't otherwise, you know, be funneled through. And so that's one uh, very important uh, aspect of this that we're focused on. But part of the appointment also is to help to assess what are some of the needs that someone may have that may make it more difficult for them uh, to make it to um, that initial court date, whether this is um, child care, whether this is transportation, um, you know, whether there are other uh, psychosocial needs, you know, that the person may have. And so, you know, really having community um, kind of wrapped around at that initial appointment uh, to be able to be there, to be able to partner with um, uh, you know, the county uh, partners, whether this is the city attorney, whether this is the uh, county attorney's office, and just to, to assess, you know, what are some of the needs of the person. And then working uh, in, in many cases to create outcomes that, you know, w would not even have them funnel through uh, the judicial process in the first place. It, it, you know, looking to see where we can work out um, um, some of these matters and some of these issues uh, right then and there and that day, um, you know, even if we're looking at, you know, restorative justice or restorative types of practices, you know, so that, you know, you know we could put, you know, a, a um, scenario in place where, you know, whoever was harmed, you know, would have been brought, you know, to a level of equity and then whoever may have done the harm is also brought. So, so that initial appointment, uh, it, it's, it's going to be really involved. It's not just going to be come, show up, you know, figure out when the court date is, and then that's it. It's really community being at the table and community wrapping their arms around, you know, what may have occurred and, you know, really looking to see what needs or what assistance, what resources, you know, someone may need, you know, in order to, you know, make that court date if, if and when you know, it's determined that the court date is going to be arranged. So as we have uh, continued our work, we came to the recognition, and this is an aspect of some humility, but that the gravity of this project is so large and it's complicated and it's really never been done before in this jurisdiction. And so we, we found ourselves recognizing that we really need some assistance, some uh, way to think about how to define and develop and create a risk assessment that would be acceptable to uh, people in law enforcement, it would be acceptable to people in the community, how do we create an infrastructure to be able to report back the decisions that are made at the jail, how do we create this paradigm where we have transparency so that we can evaluate uh, to ensure, because we don't want to do any of this if it's going to uh, cause more problems in our community, right? And so how do we ensure that that happens. Luckily for us, I guess I, one thing that's great, I want to call out Commissioner Carter for her leadership and others in the county who started that process more than a decade ago around JDAI. Uh, but we came to the recognition that we needed to do something uh, in that vein in the context of creating um, this infrastructure of uh, response and a reform so that it can be done the right way, not just us kind of coming up with some ideas and then trying to implement them. Uh, we really desperately want to be successful and so we recognized that we needed uh, to have some technical assistance and also uh, research uh, to ensure that we know that we're uh, doing good or doing uh, right by our community. And so we uh, put together in the fall of um, 2019 uh, an application to be uh, a learning site uh, to get some technical assistance. But as it turned out, um, our application was really impressive to the funders, and they recognized how novel of a, a 
project this was and what kind of great implications it could have for the rest of the nation in terms of thinking about uh, bail reform on the very front end with law enforcement and with uh, the jailing function. And so we eventually were uh, designated to be an advanced uh, research and action site, which is really great because that means it's a five-year commitment on the part of the Arnold Foundation to support uh, this work through the technical assistance. And Kyle, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, that technical assistance application and kind of what we're, how that came to be? Um, well, as you said, uh, the first application, the, the folks at Advancing Pretrial Research um, were, were very impressed with our work, our efforts, our collaborative efforts. So um, working with our partners, John's office, the sheriff's office, county board, county manager, public defender's office, city attorney's office, and, and all of us who've been at the table for the several uh, preceding months put together another application, this one for a five-year period. So now we're one of seven sites across the country that are selected to be part of this, this five-year study. And that's, that's substantial because oftentimes with technical assistance, sometimes they come in for a shorter period of time and then they leave. Uh, when you have a five-year commitment, that, that's five years of data, five years of analysis, five years of research, to make sure that we are producing justice system outcomes that are consistent with community values, that address disparities that have previously existed, um, but at the same time recognizing we ought to do better for those that we serve. And so from our office standpoint, um, I believe of the research sites, we're going to be the first sheriff's office to actually use this in a pretrial detention facility at booking. So then that really not only is a pioneering tool for us, but also supports those longer term justice system reforms and reduces those unintended consequences of the cash bail system. Yes, and, and I also, um, uh, Scott uh, Williams gave me a note because we forgot to mention an important piece of this presentation and the people that are available as a part of this, but I want all of you to know that uh, Matt Elsdorf, um, uh, who is our lead technical uh, advisor, is also on the call who can answer some questions when we get to that point. And, then, and some of you also may know Avi Viswanathan, who uh, is uh, from St. Paul, uh, but he is uh, also involved in the technical assistance and to help us with the community piece of all of this. Um, because as we move forward, I think, um, uh, we, I think we've been doing a really good job of doing that community engagement through Zach Hilton. Uh, but we want to do more of this, and so having that expertise and uh, people who are recognized and known here in our community, I think is going to be really great. We also have LaWanda Johnson uh, on the call as well as a part of the technical assistance uh, team, and we really appreciate their involvement, and they're going to be available to kind of help um, uh, any, with any discussions or any questions that uh, all of you might have. Um, so, in closing, before we get to the uh, before we get to the legislative priorities, I want to make it also very clear to the board. Uh, you know, this board and this county has really worked hard to develop some really important um, uh, values in terms of like how we do our work. And I talked about that at the beginning of my presentation. Um, and we spent a lot of time uh, working towards these about advancing and lifting up race equity. Uh, to do community engagement in a way that we're doing it the right way, you know, where we're seeing, where we view community as equal partners, as co-designers. Um, those are values that we didn't come up with. It's actually something that the county has been doing across the board uh, in all of our departments. Uh, transparency and accountability, uh, public safety and health and well-being, these are all goals that you, the commissioners, have set forth and I just want to make it absolutely clear that uh, this work group uh, very much embraces all of that. The staff that work on this embrace that, uh, and the uh, two elected officials that are involved with this, um, uh, the sheriff and myself, uh, are very, very committed uh, to uh, these particular goals. So I think the next presentation is a little bit about the legislative priorities. and. Uh, Scott, I see that you're just sitting there. Did you want me to talk about that or? I yes, I will. So, um, so there are, I believe, two asks from a legislative standpoint, and so I'll take the first one, uh, which is the 
as we think about from a county perspective about the things that we want to advocate for at the state legislature, um, I think it's uh, time where we spent uh, more time trying to infuse ourselves as a community, as a jurisdiction, as a government around the conversation that's happening at the state legislature around uh, replacing the cash bail system is something that everybody can agree on. Um, and so in order to do that, I think to, we, one of the asks that the, the bail reform working group is, is to make that a priority, that we would support uh, the elimination of cash bail and that we would work towards some effort at the legislature. There have been bills that have been uh, um, introduced uh, at the legislature. Uh, they have passed in the House, but they have not uh, gone anywhere in the Senate. But the reform uh, that has been proposed at the House level is really just focused on the really, really low-level crimes, and it's really not uh, a real reform, in my opinion. So I think that there are um, community members, there are justice advocates who really want to figure out a way to develop a state statute and to look at our rules uh, to develop a, 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 a way to do this, to have some form of pretrial supervision uh, that doesn't harm communities, that actually advances race equity, that actually advances this notion that um, we can uh, have justice and public safety at the same time without relying solely, and again, on a paradigm that was constructed at the very genesis of our country, and, but yet we perpetuate it every day, and we need to stop doing that and come up with something different that would be better. And we have some examples, like in New Jersey, um, I think uh, there's been a lot of debate about what's happened in New York, but I think those are growing pains, and I think hopefully um, we can have some other models around the country to look at. But we need to develop some state legisla legislation that would achieve that framework. And so the ask from the working group is to uh, really make that a priority for Ramsey County to be involved in that uh, conversation and propose uh, something through the, the expertise of the bail reform work group and the expertise of our intergovernmental relations staff to help us uh, develop that to maybe try to, I mean, the great vision would be to try to build a coalition that involves everybody and then we would have a very powerful voice at the legislature to say this is the, these are the changes that we would want. And I know that other communities are certainly working uh, in this regard, so I, I'm sure that we could connect with uh, communities like Hennepin, who I'm sure would love to uh, work on this as well. So the next uh, re request from a legislative standpoint is, I, I think, Scott, you're going to handle that. with uh, uh, the rest of the presentation, but it is, uh, will be part of um, a legislative uh, agenda that we bring forward uh, to the board in, uh, this fall. Uh, so we've included it here. Uh, we've, not in, we've not forgotten about fines and fees. Uh, and in the way of background, uh, it was at the year by time, time flies, a year before last, we had, uh, uh, we did a study uh, within Ramsey County around the fines and fees and looking at the, the cumulative impact of fines and fees that are levied on individuals that are moving through the criminal justice system and really looking at, you know, what is the, what is that, uh, uh, what is the cumulative impact of those fines and fees that are levied at, at different points along the way by different justice system, you know, different parts of the justice system and taking a whole list of look at what the, what the uh, collective impact is. And we were quite surprised at, uh, uh, at the burden uh, at, uh, you know, as, as individuals are coming out, trying to, you know, ex come out the other end of the criminal justice system, looking at the, the fines and fees that they've collected along the way and what a drag that is on those individuals as they try to, you know, move on with their lives. And uh, looking at, you know, what parts of that are under the county's control. In other words, those are fines and fees that are, uh, that are imposed by the county versus what are at the state level. It's outside the county's control, but are levied by, uh, by the state or by the courts. We've done a lot of work um, at the county level uh, in reducing uh, fines and fees. Um, and uh, in fact, most recently, I believe it was in March, uh, reducing uh, 
uh, uh, a significant number of fees in uh, community corrections, uh, the action that this board took in March uh, to reduce the burden on uh, county, uh, county fees. Um, but the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council has, uh, um, has been continuing to have these conversations and, and looking at this throughout the course of the year. In fact, uh, created a subcommittee to continue working on this. And looking at uh, what can we do at the, for the, the fines and fees that are levied at the state level. Um, and so to that end, we are looking at uh, uh, moving uh, two pieces of legislation um, uh, as part of our legislative agenda, the board's legislative agenda. One is to permit language to, to, to uh, come create a bill that would uh, have language in the, in, the, in the state law that would permit judges to waive a $75 surcharge. Uh, it's a surcharge on, on, on all, uh, all court criminal cases, actually it's on all court cases. Uh, so on uh, criminal cases, it would give the, uh, give the judges the ability to waive that surcharge uh, in the case of where, where uh, a defendant is, in, is indigent. They do not have that flexibility to, to do that today. Uh, so no matter what the inability to pay is for someone who's appearing in court, the very minimum they'll walk away from this transaction is something around $125 is what they will owe. The biggest piece of that is the $75 surcharge. That was a big um, finding, a major finding uh, and eye-opening uh, finding of the fines and fees study that we did uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, that's beyond our control. It's beyond the control of our, uh, of our judges um, in the second judicial district. So we were looking for uh, to propose language that would allow them to, uh, uh, to waive the $75 surcharge. The other thing we're looking at, and this is still in the development uh, phase, but this was something that was, that was uh, suggested by the cons our consultant um, uh, that worked with us on fines and fees, and that is a, uh, to pilot day fines. Uh, and essentially what that is, it's a sliding scale. It would be a sliding scale for, uh, for fines that is uh, tied to your income. I mean, we do sliding scales uh, in a lot of different areas. Why not look at that in the, in the, in the area of, of fines? Uh, it's something that we're still looking at. It's something we're still gathering data. At this point, we're not sure, um, you know, what the level of uh, fines are in our courtrooms. We're looking, we're, we're examining some, we're trying to get some data, we're trying to examine that right now. So that's still a work in progress. But don't be surprised if you see something uh, that we bring forward as part of our proposed legislative agenda this fall. But the $75 surcharge waiver will definitely be part of, uh, our, part of our, our legislative proposal. So um, with that, um, that concludes the formal part of our presentation. We've covered a lot of, uh, we've covered a lot of material. Uh, and so now we stand for questions. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Scott and John Choi and everybody at the Sheriff's Department for the great work. I have a question from uh, Commissioner Carter. Thank you. And again, just to reiterate the thanks, this is just amazing and incredible work that is being done in partnership with our community and with others in our systems who are le leaning forward to make certain to align to our goals and vision for a vibrant community where all are valued and thrive. And I just very much appreciate the manner in which a coalition has been developed around keeping our community safer by eliminating the harm that can be done in the justice system. Uh, certainly, public safety isn't for itself, it's for all of us. And so if we truly all can be valued, we truly all can thrive um, and create ways in which even the system, if it's a system that's guided by the community for which it is required, can respond. So thank you so much. I am uh, particularly encouraged by the manner in which we are moving more and more upstream. And so if in fact there are ways that we can change the need for someone who has been allegedly offending in our community, to be in the community, to be at work, to take care of family and responsibility. 
if there's no public safety threat, if there is assurance that that person will come to court, thank you so much, all of you, for leaning in to make sure that that will become a reality. I want to look at the boxes that um, you have presented that show a change in that system. And clearly in slide nine, uh, where you show a person being brought in and booked into the adult detention center and waiting for an uh, assessment and ability to be released uh, is not preferable. We're moving in a direction where on slide 10, you're showing us that an assessment can happen so much earlier and that an individual could be released and given an appointment if in fact that assessment would show they need to be held because of those questions not being appropriately answered, they might not come to court or they're a public safety threat, then it would be appropriate that that person be held. I'm encouraged that that early assessment can happen. The one question I'd ask about, as I know that we're in this process where we have technical assistance from the Arnold Foundation, we're a research site, so they're going to learn from us and our learnings will help others across the country, which is great. I just want to also ask the question about what we may learn from looking into our detention center and whether or not that's a hard and concrete need all the time. Or if it might be possible that we're able to move the assessment forward ahead of the booking step at some point, you know, Just trying to be a visionary together and understanding that that booking is in fact itself a collateral consequence and can be down the road for individuals who are in our system. So we may be able to think of other creative ways of moving that box um, that is the assessment for eligibility forward. And I just wanna ask the question about whether this could be a possibility even during that time frame that we think creatively. I don't have the answers today and I know you may not have them either but if there is a possibility that even within that five year time frame, we could be thinking about some processes that would help us um, to avoid a booking step. If in fact that person is not going to need to be held for bail evaluation, the assessment can happen earlier and perhaps that collateral consequence could be avoided. Um, just a forward thinking question. I wonder if you'd have a response there. Um, I think I'll go ahead and take a first shot at that question. So thank you, Commissioner Carter, for um, your uh, words today, as well as the question. Um, I think that um, what you're describing is actually what I would describe as law enforcement assisted diversion. Um, I think that's another step in terms of getting even more upstream, um, especially in the context of if we could think about as a community to build an alternative to the jail because right now that's the default that police would operate under, that if I arrest somebody, I have to take them to jail. But as we build this coalition and this work, and bring in law enforcement, be a part of this process and start having this conversation about uh, making sure that we're only having people in custody who absolutely need to be there and that we're thinking about other things. If we had an alternative to the jail, uh, because the vast majority of um, the situations that are out there in our community uh, that are negative, uh, I would say a lot of it is driven by mental health. It's been driven by uh, addiction, right? And so if we can continue to build trust with our community, build trust with law enforcement, and actually bridge divides together and think about some solutions. I think we could also get to that notion sometime in our future, Commissioner Carter, about thinking about law enforcement assisted diversion where clearly what's going on here is not so much a criminal justice issue, but something where we need to connect community with this particular person and this person to services. And so we have some models that exist throughout the country. 
uh, in this particular area, but I think police could be informed by uh, certain policies uh, that the community, I think, should help uh, develop about what they can do. The community can be involved with advocating for some uh, alternative, and to, to make that happen, I'm not, I'm not going to put that into all action and say it's got to look like this or it's got to feel like that, but just some alternative where the police can take them directly to a place where they're going to get mental health uh, treatment and we're going to look at it from that perspective. Um, so there are law enforcement assisted diversion programs that exist around the country. It's called LEAD, L-E-A-D, and there's a number of them uh, that have been operating and I would love it if we could get to a conversation. Uh, with our police uh, to embrace that and make that a reality as well, which then would be even going up further upstream, as you suggested, Commissioner Carter. Thank you for your response. I wonder if I might follow up, Chair Ortega. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. I, I really do appreciate your acknowledgement that there are ways to get even further upstream. We continue to talk about that. I would also suggest that your thought about law enforcement assisted diversion is a, is a part of where we could go. There may be cases where an individual could be brought forward to us and it could be that a charge would occur later. And I know as you're thinking about what serious crimes are and what is detainable, you know, you, you will be thinking through more and more of how uh, even where there could be a charge that could be applied later, there may be cases where an individual who has committed a, an offense but who will come to court, who will in fact um, not continue to reoffend by assessment, you know, although there could be a charge that could be pending, might yet be released into the community. So I'm really talking a step beyond that law enforcement assisted diversion perhaps to an, just an opening to continue to think about that because we know that in particular the disparities in our community don't just happen uh, in the jail or at the charge. They happen earlier and as we continue to try to move upstream to try to avoid those consequences that are collateral consequences that can be damaging to people's lives and to all of us as a community would be something I would hope we will continue to be open for. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Carter. I now have Commissioner McGuire. Uh, and anybody that's on, uh, please mute if you're not speaking. Thank you. Mary Jo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, County. Tony Attorney Choi and all of all of the team that's working on this. It's it's exciting to hear this work that's that's happening, and we just appreciate all of your work. So I have a, have a few questions um, that uh, I'll start first with my, um, my legislative questions, and I'm excited that we're uh, thinking about that now, what before the legislative session in January. Um, and just curious if um, if there's already, is there already a legislative team working on this or are you proposing to start one? Uh, and then while you're answering that, my my other question there, stations such as the County Attorney's Association, the Sheriff's Association that are um, also supporting this. So if you could talk a little bit about both of those things. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner McGuire for that question. Oh. Um, the, uh, Sorry, County Attorney, you're on mute. So, oh, oh. can you hear me? No, no? Can, you can't hear me. I can't hear I you. Can. can others hear you? Yes, I think I oh, can. Oh, sorry. Hear. Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay, so I think I'll proceed with my answer. Thank you, Commissioner uh, McGuire, for that question. Um, I think the uh, work from a legislative standpoint of trying to pull together proposals relatively in um, an early, early stage. I think the legislation that currently exists now that was proposed by Representative Mohammed Noor from Minneapolis, um, that was something, a collaboration of advocates over in Minneapolis with their city attorney's office in Minneapolis. Uh, but again, that's a very low level kind of bail for, I wouldn't even necessarily call it the, the vision that we 
have as a part of our working group. Uh, we would love to see uh, a, some convening of people to really kind of have some conversations, kind of like what we've been doing as a part of the, the bail reform work group locally here, but we need to do it at the state level. I know that there have been some efforts by the Minneapolis Foundation uh, to pull together various stakeholders and community uh, to try to pull something together, but nothing has really happened. So I think we just need to continue being a part of that, but maybe we could drive that discussion by actually pulling together the, the right stakeholders and the advocates and law enforcement, all the various stakeholders, and come up with some sort of a solution. So I think it's too early to have anything presented to, like for instance, the, the Sheriff's Association or the County Attorney's Association. Um, but I think the, the work that needs to happen right now is kind of like the formation of getting all of those various interests that are interested in this together. And I feel like in some ways, um, we're at the start of that. Um, so that's really the, the request is I think for, for Ramsey County to be, you know, to be a leader in that and to engage and to offer some ideas, but it would be great to have some package that would be comprehensive, uh, that uh, would align much like what some other states have boldly uh, done, uh, but we just need to do it in the right way so that we bring together um, everybody and, and we work together towards it. Thank you. Okay, is that a, are you done, Mary Jo? Hello? Okay, I have Commissioner Fredham. Nicole? Thank you. Uh, I, again, wanna kind of echo other statements, just this is really exciting work and um, really excited to see everyone pulling together for a common cause, I think more of this is is really um, just needed to solve these big problems. So I'm I'm thrilled. Uh, Mr. Darris answered one of my questions was, you know, will, will we be doing anything to make sure that um, finances won't keep someone from making their appointment? Because it seems like if, if cash bail is going to, to keep them in jail, it'd be a, a problem if it would also keep them from getting their appointment. But I think a, a follow-up that I have from that is, um, has there been any discussion around the potential that there may, there may be disparities in who will benefit from the bail reform program and how can we proactively mitigate that? Uh, Chair, I just want to try to clarify, uh, Commissioner, the question. So you're saying that there may be uh, charities or there may be programs that might benefit from, is that what I heard you say? Uh, I said there may be disparities oh, in who may be benefiting from the bail reform program just because there may be disparities in who is you know, more likely to, to come back to that hearing, who, who might benefit from this bill reform, and how can we be proactive and really mitigate those disparities? Okay. Um, I'm still trying to capture the question, but I think my partner over here has the question down pat, so I'm, I'm going to pass it to him to answer. Thank you. Madam Chair, Commissioner Fretham, um Thank you, my name is Greg Lewin. I'm currently the interim executive director for the Minnesota Freedom Fund. Um, it's wonderful to be in this space. A lot of gratitude to the folks in this room who helped get us situated and resourced um, early on in Ramsey County. So to, to make sure I understand your question, Commissioner, this is a, a fundamentally a question of support to those who may not be resourced to then make their subsequent Court appearance is that is that a correct understanding of your question? No, no, I'm going to redirect. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my initial question, which I felt like I answered. Okay. My question is, um, as as we're looking at people and making these decisions about who who gets you know benefit of this bail reform program and who gets held for bail evaluation, that there may be disparities and who gets selected yeah. for one okay. or the other, yeah. right? Who, how do we be proactive and mitigate those potential disparities? And what have we done proactively?
actively to think through that because of just naturally the, the support systems in place so by who's going to show up, what have we done to think through that, um, and, you know, through this research, are we going to be tracking that? Yeah, so, so I can answer that one, Commissioner. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. So, so a, a few things that, that we've set up in place uh, to, to certainly mitigate that. One uh, is uh, we're looking to bring in community-based researchers uh, to partner alongside with uh, the Arnold uh, Foundation and also the technical advisors. Uh, and so these are really trusted uh, community-based researchers that do really high-level work and have been doing consistent high-level work for many years. Um, and, and so we're just we're right now working to finalize the details of bringing those community-based researchers uh, on board. Uh, that's one. But then secondly, uh, uh, you know, we have been and, and likely will be finalizing the details with uh, working with some of the local foundations uh, to help to resource us to be able to bring in community um, um, ambassadors, so to speak, uh, who can make sure that they're doing consistent outreach uh, efforts uh, to make sure that we can get people to that initial um, um, uh, it's, it's not a, a, a court hearing to that initial appointment. Um, and, and so if they're if, at, at the at the at the assessment that happens in the county jail, uh, that is a needs assessment that helps us determine whether or not they're going to need um, transportation or child care even to get to that. So even before they leave the jail, we have information about what they might need. Uh, and uh, we've been working also to potentially create vouchers uh, with child care um, agencies, uh, you know, that could, you know, they can give the voucher to the uh, child care agency and they'll be able to make that initial appointment as well. Um, you know, we also are having discussions about transportation and getting people there and also bringing in multiple community-based organizations. Uh, once we get to that phase, we're going to bring in more and more uh, community-based groups. Uh, but I would say that those community ambassadors that are going to be uh, financed uh, are going to be a critical component as well, uh, making sure that, you know, there's outreach and that there is consistent efforts uh, to, to mitigate that. So the community-based researchers and also the community-based uh, um, ambassadors uh, that are all part of uh, that initial uh, appointment, I think, are all critical. And then that initial assessment, that needs assessment that happens pretty immediately uh, when they are first obtained. And Commissioner Fredner, if, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just add on what um, Eli also mentioned. I think also, too, is that the framework upon which all of this work stands, um, it's, we're veering, being very, very intentional to include and be informed uh, by impacted community. Um, that is a critical value of this work group. And so as a part of uh, the work that we're doing, uh, we're doing this in a co-design type of fashion. So as we think about creating the risk assessment instrument, uh, we're going to be doing it together. And as Eli talked about, we want to bring in community, trusted community researchers uh, to be a part of this so they can help uh, translate some of the technical information, right? And then we set up um, a framework of transparency and actual reporting so that like on a real-time basis, every month, the work group and other stakeholders are getting this information so that we can look at the data and we can look at it across race, we can look at it across gender. All of the things that are being articulated now as a part of the work group, um, we're creating this framework um, to be able to accomplish those things, or at least if not accomplishing them, uh, that we'll know right away and then we can start you know, asking questions, et cetera. Um, and and, and I, I would add, uh, Commissioner, that, uh, you know, the potential for disparities uh, has been foremost on many of our minds, and it's, you know, part of the reason why you, we, we, we want to try to get as much um, data aggregated as possible. It's why we've been pushing uh, to have um, um, the various different IS departments and these various different um, agencies that are us all involved to really pull data um, and, and to have that data begin to communicate with each other. Um, that has been something that I've spoken up about in multiple, multiple of our meetings. Uh, and and it's, it's a critical focus of ours as community uh, because we know this is novel, this is new. 
um, the, the way that we are um, going about this process hasn't really been implemented really anywhere across the country. And so as community, uh, that has been something we've been very vocal about is we want to be we want to be as close to the front end of recognizing when disparities are happening so that, you know, if and when it's necessary to make, you know, a pivot, you know, we would be able to have the data early to make that pivot. And so we've been very, very vocal uh, in these meetings about how we can make that happen. Um, and I think recently they were able to do the data pools that, you know, we've been discussing. Yes. So to that point, too, we're in the process of getting agreements in place with RTI with Arnold, uh, with the advancing pretrial research folks to be able to share data. Data also includes going back to 2017 or 2016, as well as going forward. And the, the great advantage of the technical assistance is it's, it's five years of accountability, it's five years of analysis, it's, it's five years of really looking through and making us think through all, the, all of our work. And that I think is one of the best safeguards to, to minimize disparities going forward. Just to quickly add on to that with the, the idea of being data driven at every stage, um, very grateful for the idea that data analysis is happening on the back end before an instrument is implemented here and not waiting for results to come in and then seeing how the instrument is performing. The idea of community expert involvement um, that, that Eli Darris touched on from the ACLU who we're so grateful to have be a leader in this space um, is huge. One data point. Uh, I can bring forward from Minnesota Freedom Fund's bail work is that um, over 85% of the individuals who come to us um, who we've bailed out, uh, which is only, there is no worthiness assessment happening there, it's only ability to pay, over 85% of those individuals have been indigenous or people of color um, since we've been active in Ramsey. And so it sounds as though I'm very heartened to hear um, that, that there's such a broad consensus understanding that this isn't a crisis issue and that this does need to shift and um, it's really heartening to, to hear this. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I now have Jim McDonough, Commissioner McDonough. Yep, thanks Madam Chair. I just want to uh, thank all the partners here for your work on this and um, I think um, this is this is really good stuff. But the the one piece, the one comment I would have, and it goes back to Commissioner com, Carter's comments about and uh, County Attorney Choi's comments about like law enforcement assisted diversion, and we've talked about um, co-responding models for mental health response or a chemical dependency response. You know that as we're looking at this thinking how far can we go as a community and what what are these are these bridges to us going farther and deeper into the community versus are these um, an end result on their own and they become part of our legacy system you know John as you pointed out we're dealing with stuff that was established at the beginning of this country and we're figuring out how to take that apart and do better um, and so with this opportunity, with this five-year commitment from the Arnold Foundation, um, I encourage all of us to be thinking about what can we do now, but what is that bridge to what's next, to what's next, to what's next, so we can continue to improve our response in our community and what that response is um, versus an end in itself and I've been a part of these for so many, so often, and there's, there, it's a lot of work to just make sometimes minor changes in a legacy system that a lot of people protect to keep going. That it's like, we've got this done. That was a lot of work. You know, let's celebrate and then be done with it. If we start from the beginning that the, the, we've got a lot of work to do, we can only do so much, we can only take small bites of the elephant at a time, but there's an elephant here that we have to dismantle and, and change for our community, I think we can even do better um, than what we think we can do in our community, especially with the partnership and the willingness of everybody that you've brought, to, or all of us have come to the table on, here to really have it uh, make a difference in our community on this. So just a couple of comments there about 
really thinking forward here about what's next as we are trying to make the changes today to have that um, really make a change. Um, um, we talked about it, you know, on the 911 response, you know, it's always a law enforcement response. And then we moved to a co-responder response. And what's the next step where it isn't even a, a law enforcement response for so many of these cases, especially when it comes to mental health in our community where we don't even need law enforcement assisted diversion because we've already gotten farther upstream than that. So. With that, I'll, uh, uh, again, I just want to thank John and the sheriff's office and the community and the judges and, and everybody for coming together, policy and planning, and, and the leadership from the county manager's office and the support from this board. Thank you, Commissioner McDonough. I now have Commissioner Reinhardt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I can tell you that um, a lot of what I had to say, Commissioner McDonough just covered, um, because I really do, other than the fact that I don't want to eat an elephant, I just got to say that up front. Um, anyhow, I, but we do need to recognize what's going on. And I just um, feel very strongly about the fact that we've been talking about systems, and then we talk about the importance and value of every individual coming in. Um, even though this is one part of what we're trying to do, um, it is such a critical part because of the interconnectedness, the interconnectedness between mental health, addiction, uh, criminal activity, poverty, um, people of color, indigenous. I mean, all of this comes together and it's all interconnected. Getting back to the whole idea of what we're trying to do is have a uh, safer, healthier, uh, prosperous community as we go forward. So the prosperity, opportunity, well-being for all is really about taking these little pieces and bringing them together. And so it, it was, um, as I was listening to, especially Commissioner McDonough, but others as well, how important that system change happens because of the pieces that we take and put together and not just sitting back and saying, okay, well, we got that done. Um, we've got to move on to something else. Um, I think that the fact that we have um, I think it's a, about 80 plus percent of the folks that are coming into our system that have mental health issues. Um, that plays a part in this as well. There's so many different parts of it. I guess um, I, I really want to commend um, what we've been doing and the, um, the thorough way that we've involved all the community, the stakeholders, really trying to come forward with something that's going to be long lasting. So when we talk about uh, bail reform, I just want to remind people that what we're talking about is um, really dealing with some of the disparities and equities in our system and how we are trying to, how we're trying to make changes to a system that really comes down to what do we do uh, for the individual so that it helps society, um, everyone in, in, in total. Um, when I was doing research um, for a paper that I wrote on uh, crime prevention and what we need to do, I, I re referenced the fact that, um, you know, you, you come into a doctor's office, and if every time you come into the doctor's office, they assume that you're starting with a broken arm, they're going to put a cast on you. Um, and the fact of the matter is everybody that comes into our system has a different issue. Um, and sometimes it may mean that we have to do something um, that is more um, difficult or taking on all of the issues so that the individual can um, end up being a, a productive uh, part of society. So it all comes down to what we do at, at this individual level um, when we're looking at system change and um, ultimately not only do we have a safer society, a healthier society, um, but we also save money. I mean, the, the fact is a lot of things um, as we are moving forward, trying to put money into incarceration and all of the other things that are part of this system are of home placement. Um, if we can do better before they get into the system, as again, Commissioner McDonough said, um, we're all better off for it. So as from a safety perspective and every other perspective. 
So again, um, <clears throat> the system change, even though, even though for those that are listening may seem like a small part of it, it's really gonna make a big difference in the overall system as we recognize that interconnectedness. So um, thank you. I, I don't have any questions. I'm just pleased with the partnership with the community, with uh, the sheriff's office, the county attorney's office, and keeping the, the overall goals in mind. So thank you. Um, this has been a great update and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Uh, I assume that everybody has spoken. I, I, I'm having technical difficulties, so I cannot tell who might still have their hands up but I'm assuming that we're all good. Mr. Chair. Mary Jo, did okay. you wanna speak? I was, yeah, can you hear me or is it still bad? Just, well, go ahead, we can hear you well, now. I just, I just wanna apologize for my technical difficulties I'm having here. So if you're not, I, I was gonna make a couple of comments, um, but I won't do that if everybody's having trouble hearing me, if it's, um, if it's problematic, I, I just want to, I'll just say it that I, I'd love a, in a future meeting to get a, a, you know, just some more feedback on our coordinated response with um, police calls involving mental health and how we're working with our cities, maybe on that with all of our cities on some of those coordinated responses. I just heard a talk um, at our AMC Public Safety Committee at Dakota County is working on that. I, I know we're working on it, and so I would just love an update on how we're doing with all of that. But just thanks to everyone for all your work on, on this, on this effort. So thanks. All right. Thank you very much. We'll keep that in mind for the next agenda. Yes, Let me sure. just, as a wrap up, I think in terms of the legislative, we have. Uh, I think I heard consensus from the board, and please uh, speak out if I'm not correct in terms of the waiver. Uh, for the mandated $75 surcharge, and then also sliding scale for persons, uh, uh, sliding fee scale is, is what it comes down, uh, based on a person's ability to pay. Uh, and we could include that in our legislative agenda as we move forward into the next session. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Also, I just wanna thank everybody. I wanna, uh, especially the county sheriff and the uh, county attorney but also the community, obviously, just from the presentation, uh, they were playing a lead role in this, and that makes us, I think, feel good about how we're heading and where we're going. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, all the rest of the county staff, too numerous to mention, but there are so many players involved in this, and it's, uh, it's critical because it's going to take a lot of players to implement. So thank you very much to everybody, and... Uh, uh, we look forward for an update in the near future. Mr. Chair. Um, yes, go ahead, John. I uh, also, I think it would, we really need to also, I think, um, introduce our technical staff. It would be great to have um, uh, Matt and Lawanda and Avi just say something because um, yes. I view them to be so critical in our, our success moving forward. I'm so, I feel so grateful. Uh, that we've been um, offered this opportunity to have this level of technical assistance and research assistance, and we've got some local people here. So I just think it'd be great if we could just really briefly hear from Matt, Lawanda, and Avi, just to even just say hello, to introduce themselves yes. to our community. Please do. I haven't seen Avi in a while. Please go ahead. <laughs> Avi, do you want to start or shall I? No, oh, whoever. Matt, why don't you go ahead so you can introduce. Okay. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be working with, with all of you in Ramsey County. Um, my background, I actually worked at the Arnold Foundation um, for a number of years during the period where we developed the risk assessment and we really started to focus on pretrial justice. And I think it's what you all are considering and pursuing is fantastic because the, the point of our focus on the bail decision was that we thought we needed to, to move the focus to the earliest point of the, the system that we could. Um, and that seemed like the best opportunity eight years ago. But now you're moving it even further forward to try to figure out who actually needs to be in our jails, who actually needs to be in our justice system. And let's make sure that we're making the right decisions 
as upfront as quickly as possible. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be working with you all and, and really looking forward to this project. Thank you. So Thank you. who's next? I, I'll go next. My name is Lawanda okay. Johnson. Um, I'll be working with um, Ramsey County um, providing communications technical assistance with um, Holly Zemer. So we will be working on um, how you would talk about uh, the work that you will be doing over the next five years. Um, we will we'll be training you to um, really um, be able to communicate um, both internally and externally about the project and, and how it is designed to um, help you move forward in your, um, in your uh, pre-trial reform um, project. So um, I will be reaching out hopefully to um, your communications point of contacts immediately to get started on this. So we're really looking forward to it. We have five great years and we're, we're really excited about it. So. Thank you and welcome aboard. Thanks. Hello all, uh, I'm really excited to be here. And as Commissioner Ortega mentioned before, it's been a while since I've seen a number of you, um, but I sit here in Ramsey County, able to talk to you all uh, about this work. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I know a number of you and you are aware of my uh, connections in community and, and desire to help build community engagement in the systems that, that we have. Um, I have been working with APPR since um, January of this year to support this particular project and to help with the sort of the entire structure and the, the system. I've been part of a group called the Racial Equ Equity and Community Engagement Committee. Uh, and now I'm gonna start working with this specific site. And when I was approached, it was incredibly exciting. I'm familiar with a lot of the work that you all, you all have done. Uh, you know, over the last decade or so, uh, I've been able to connect and, and see some of the um, the great connections in community. And so my role as a technical assistance provider around community engagement is not to recreate any of the work that, that you all have done, but is to support and help build on that and provide any um, assistance or advice that, that I can. Um, one of the things that I want to reflect on throughout this conversation is that when we refer to this as a system, one of my colleagues would like to say that communities don't always experience the criminal justice system as an actual system, but as disjointed pieces. And you all have really brought together the, the importance of the interconnectedness. So I want to help keep that viewpoint as the, you know, as you think about the, the long term. And um, Commissioner McDonough, as you were saying earlier, one of the things when you think about the long term, the only sustainable piece or the only piece that will exist throughout the entirety of the reform are communities. They're the only things that survive that unless we, you know, I mean, they can be pushed aside or uh, erased or ignored, but they are the people who still exist. And so to have that be an integral part of this work is, and that that is necessary, that is completely necessary. And um, that foundation has already been laid here in Ramsey County, and I'm excited to continue to support that. Thank you. Good seeing you again. Who, who else do we have? Well, who's this? Well, thank you. I, I think we're all done, John. I think uh, we, Zach Hilton wants to say just to close up too. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioners, and everybody that's been a part of this work. I just wanted to, to, to speak to put somewhat of a bow on what this effort is and how it's connected to a lot of the other work that's going on across the, the justice system. Um, so I get the, the privilege of sitting at the table and, and sending out the invites, potentially putting together the agendas alongside community and leadership for not only this effort, but uh, the criminal justice coordinating uh, Council, um, the Burns Institute work, uh, supporting that effort to um, just a number of projects here and there across the justice system. And I think uh, this effort specifically is, is kind of like a, um, another example of the potential of how 
this community can start working together to really push our justice system to transform. So I think it would be, it would be obtuse to like somehow recognize this effort as like not at all connected with the movement that's going on locally, nationally, globally. And so as we define what our role is and what our efforts are in, in, in trying to be leaders in that space, like this is, this is the beginning of, a, of an opportunity. Um, so I, I guess alongside the asks, um, with, with the legislative priorities and the, the request for head nod approval on the direction of, of the bail reform effort, um, I think there is there is a con at least from my side and from the community that I I hope to represent just a, con an, a continuous ask for attention and and engagement from from our board and leadership on uh, us taking the risks to move forward our justice system and transform it in a way into a place that we haven't really seen before. And I think that risk involves a level of engagement that I haven't, that I don't think we've like fully embarked on yet, but we've taken strides to like engage community. Um, you see law enforcement at the table here. There's much more that we have to do there, but um, this shows that we can start to make those, we can start to take those chances and take those risks. And I, and I hope that our board sees, sees the opportunity to continue to pressure us to take more risks and, and uh, I guess buy in with us on the risks that we're taking alongside our community and our system leadership. So that's, that I think would be my like closing piece. And I just thank you to everybody that's part of this and moving this forward. Thank you. I think uh, that, that uh, on that note, we'll close the meeting and uh, turn it over to Commissioner Carter. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ortega, for your leadership of this committee workshop. And to all who are doing this work, I guess I would just expand on uh, what Mr. Hilton just said at the end, no pain, no gain. Uh, we are certainly taking some risk. They are calculated risk together with our community on what can happen when we have a vision such as we do, of a community united, an equitable environment, and health and well-being for all. And so thank you so much for guiding us along that pathway uh, to deputy, to our deputy county manager, Scott Williams, to County Attorney Choi, to the Sheriff's Department represented today by Kyle Meestad for all of the work that you are doing and to all of the system partners, to our community partners. It is so fantastic to see you here today and speaking into this work such as you have. We have a lot of work to do and as long as we're doing it together, I am certain that we will get to our destination. I kind of feel like a, a young person. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? We're not, but we are certainly headed in the right destination or in the right direction to our destination because of all of you who are doing this work with us, local and national partners, uh, some new, some returning, some who've been with us all along. So once again, thank you. Uh, we are at the conclusion of the meeting um, and moving into our next. Our board meeting will be concluded and followed by a regional rail meeting, again, chaired by Commissioner Ortega. And then this afternoon, we will have a county board workshop at 1.30 focused on new technology for board documents. I legislate. Uh, thank you all for your attention and your work during this meeting. I'm going to close out the board meeting. We will take a, uh, let's say, five minute break again. We will come Madam back. Chair, do you wanna finish off the agenda with the legislative report and county connections and board updates? Or are you gonna- Oh, not do any okay. Of we, because we have a workshop today, yeah. we typically do not have those pieces in okay. our board meeting. So now, Okay, they just uh, and they were on the agenda, so you might we might just want to acknowledge that we won't be doing if those. If they things. are on the if they are on the agenda, I'm going to ask for a quick round then before we close out. Well, 
uh, Commissioner Ortega. Madam Chair, I just want to say that some of us have a 12 o'clock with the judges, a court meeting. Thank you. So let's see um, the yeah. time. Yeah, and so per tradition then, um, we have passed our agenda, but uh, the, the chair will ask for um, the ability to move through then on to our next meeting so that we will have time uh, to get through all of our work this morning and we will be back at 1.30 and such times we'll decide whether we can do that round, all right? Are there any objections? So just to be clear, Madam Chair, so you're, you're delaying, yeah, we're just postponing the rest of the agenda till the afternoon if we get time for the afternoon. I just wanna make sure we, we're acknowledging, okay. yeah. Thank you so much. So yes, typically when we have a workshop, we do not do the balance of that agenda. We'll make the decision not to now, we'll come back at 1.30 and we will address it at that time. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and so at this point in time, thank Madam, you all. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, mm. if I may interrupt. I hear someone, but I don't see who. Chime in. This is Janet Three. Um, Janet. The, the workshop is not um, a county board meeting. The agenda that you have on the uh, board meeting today cannot be picked up at the afternoon session. So... You thank either. you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It is not a recess for our county board meeting. That is correct. It is a workshop. And so uh, let me just ask quickly, Commissioner McGuire, if you have something that you would like to share immediately with consensus from the rest of the board, then after your update, we will conclude our meeting. If there are objections, please raise your hands in the participant list. Commissioner McGuire. Madam Chair, I don't have anything that I need to to um, to share. I mean, I have a legislative update and and, and updates from um, outside board and committees. But but I just want to acknowledge that on the agenda for anyone watching, we do have thank you. We do have these other items, and we're just we're just choosing to delay them. That I'm just acknowledging that. Thank I mean, you. I will just say right. that. Yeah. Thank you so much. That I, for I think being we just attentive. want to acknowledge that we're 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 just. Um, not taking up any of the other items. We're, we'll take them up next week then. Or and we will take them up next week. Thank you very much. And with that then, I see no further objection. Our meeting is concluded.